Have you ever tried to grab onto something that you felt was so close, but as soon as you reached for it, it suddenly drifted away? It's a disappointing feeling. But what if it never ends? Susan Billig knew what it felt like when feelings of hope and despair mixed together. Especially when her 17-year-old daughter Amy went missing from Coconut Grove, Florida, never to be seen again. Amy Billig was born on January 9, 1957, in Oyster Bay, New York City, to parents Ned Solomon and Susan Billig, after multiple failed pregnancies. It's safe to say that Amy was Susan and Ned's miracle baby. But just a year after Amy was born, the family welcomed a baby boy, Joshua, on February 14, 1958. When Amy was 11 and Josh was 10, the Billig family moved from New York to Southern Florida due to the increasing crime rate in the city. Amy's parents owned an art gallery near Commodore Plaza, and both Amy and Josh attended private schools. Amy was the human form of 1970s culture. She was easy to get along with because she was so gentle and caring. She loved to sing and played instruments like the flute and guitar. She was religious and belonged to the Jewish faith. She also loved reading and writing and kept a diary in which she wrote a ton of poetry. Amy also loved animals and was a vegetarian by choice. Given her gifted creativity, Amy had aspirations of becoming an actress. Amy, being born in the 70s, was the epitome of a flower child. She had a free spirit and would frequently hike to places and make friends with pretty much anyone. On March 31st, 1974, Amy was awaiting her graduation from Adelphi Academy of Coral Gables and wanted to follow her dreams of becoming an actress. But a few weeks before she could celebrate her graduation, Amy was nowhere to be seen, and her disappearance would shake the entire community of Coconut Grove. On March 5, 1974, Amy returned home from school after a normal Tuesday and wanted to meet some friends later on that day. When she returned home, she called her father at his art gallery from their home landline to ask if she could borrow some money from him for lunch with her friends at Peacock Park. Her father, Ned, agreed and Amy changed into a denim skirt and cork platform sandals. She grabbed her camera, which she always took with her wherever she went, and proceeded to hitchhike to her father's gallery, which was less than a mile away. Now, hitchhiking wasn't uncommon at the time that this case took place. It was the 1970s. People used to hitchhike all the time. It was relatively safe. Remember, people seldom even locked their doors at night, and security cameras were a rarity. My parents were actually growing up during this time period, and my mom once told me the story about her and her family going on vacation for a week, then coming back home to find their front door unlocked and wide open. No one had broken in, the family just forgotten to shut the door before leaving. Not a single item in that house was touched, even after being left wide open for a full week. That's the type of atmosphere we're talking about here. And it can be easy to forget those days when we think of them in the context of how bad things have gotten in the present day. But this perception of safety soon changed for the Billig family, because Amy had now disappeared. She never reached her father's gallery to get the money that she wanted. 17-year-old Amy Billig essentially disappeared from Coconut Grove and was never seen again. Around the evening of that same day, Susan and Josh began to worry because Amy hadn't returned home. This behavior was not normal for Amy at all. Their fears doubled when Ned returned home and confirmed that Amy never came to the gallery. Susan also called Amy's friends and was horrified to learn that Amy never made it to lunch with her friends either. This caused panic within the Billig family, and the police were immediately called. The police tried to reassure Susan that Amy would return, and Detective Michael Gonzalez said, quote, don't panic, call back if Amy isn't home by morning. While waiting on pens and needles, March 6th rolled around. At 6 a.m., a frantic Susan called the police, and finally, an official search for Amy began. While investigating and asking people around the area where Amy could have been, the police found a lead. Some construction workers had seen Amy get into a white van in the early afternoon in Coconut Grove, close to her home. The community was tight-knit, and everyone immediately was concerned for Amy and her safety, as she didn't return home even after multiple days had passed. On March 18th, 13 days after Amy was last seen, a camera tossed on the grass beside the Wildwood exit on Florida's Turnpike was recovered by a hitchhiking college student. This area was about 250 miles northwest of Miami. 
When the camera was taken in as evidence and shown to the Billig family, they confirmed that it was indeed Amy's camera. The police wanted to take a look at the photos, so they were sent for development. But most of the photos led to nothing, as they were extremely overexposed and nothing could be made out. But two photos stood out to the police. They were of a light-colored, possibly white pickup truck in front of a building covered in vines. If you remember, Amy was seen by construction workers getting into a white van. So this may have been a clue in the right direction. It's unknown, though, whether the developed pictures were from the same day when Amy disappeared or not. But the police had something nonetheless. Investigators held on to this sliver of evidence, but they couldn't identify the building or the white vehicle since the picture didn't have any information like street numbers or license plates. Susan pleaded with the police officers to inspect Amy's room for evidence of any fingerprints because she believed that whoever took Amy might have been someone close to her. But the police initially thought that Amy was a runaway and didn't bother to check for any fingerprints. After some time, though, when it was clear that Amy hadn't run away and that someone had possibly abducted her, the police finally went to Amy's house to check for fingerprints. Unfortunately, though, given the humidity and classic Florida weather, the fingerprints were gone. This was a huge blunder on the police's part because they lost a chance of finding something that could explain Amy's disappearance. Susan, trying her hardest to find her daughter, started her own investigation on the side and hired a private investigator to help her find Amy. Susan and Ned were trying their best to spread the word of Amy's disappearance. They printed posters in English and in Spanish, held a vigil for Amy, and went door to door for any information or sighting of Amy and called the Miami PD almost daily for updates on the case. Susan spent her free time in Amy's room, trying to reconnect with her daughter because she missed her terribly. But while in her room one day, Susan took a peek at Amy's diary, and she found an entry that sent shivers down her spine. Six weeks before Amy disappeared, she wrote in her diary that she'd made plans with a man named Hank to go to South America. She even called the idea crazy. Now, this entry left Susan rather uneasy. Amy was very close with her family, and she almost always shared everything with her mother. So why didn't she ever say anything about this Hank guy or having plans to go to South America? This detail is pertinent and it comes back later in the case, so stick around. 16 days following Amy's disappearance, Susan received a call from two twin brothers, 16-year-old Charles and Larry Glasser. They said that they had kidnapped Amy and demanded $30,000 in ransom. The police followed this lead immediately and on March 22nd, the callers were arrested from a local hotel. Susan was hopeful that Amy was soon going to be with her family, but the boys didn't have her. They were lying and trying to cash in on the helplessness of the Billig family. The boys were charged with extortion and they pleaded guilty. This sent the police back to square one. Following the unsuccessful lead of the Glasser twins, Susan received multiple leads daily, all of which led this poor woman on a wild goose chase. But multiple believable leads involved something very dark. The entailment that Amy had been abducted by a biker gang, either by the outlaws or the pagans. The reason why this lead was plausible was that biker gangs had a dark history of abusing women for, well, all the obvious reasons that they would want to do that. The leads were solidified when someone said that they'd seen Amy getting on a bike with someone who looked like a member of the gang on the day that she disappeared. In the 1970s, the outlaws and the pagans were the two main biker gangs roaming the streets of Coconut Grove and it was believed that they had abducted Amy and were holding her hostage. Susan had no choice but to follow these leads, and they led her to a local convenience store in the Orlando area. The store manager looked at Amy's photo and immediately recalled a very specific incident. She claimed to have seen a girl resembling Amy with two men who looked like bikers, coming to the store and buying vegetable soup. Now, this specific detail caused Susan's ears to perk up because Amy, as mentioned, was a vegetarian. The store manager also said that the girl hardly spoke and was referred to by the bikers as Mute, or Little Bit, and Mellow Cheryl. This encounter solidified the biker gang theory, and before you know it, Susan, with no fear for her life, tried to talk to members of the biker gang to get any information of her missing daughter. In January of 1976, Susan was approached by an ex-member of a biker gang, Paul, and they agreed to go to his house in order to give Susan information on Amy. Paul told Susan that he had owned Amy while she was in the gang, 
He also said that the girl was submissive, quiet, and almost mute, which, if you remember, is the same thing that the convenience store manager in Orlando said too. He told Susan that Amy was still alive, but being held hostage by the gang. Understandably, Susan was apprehensive to believe Paul at first. For confirmation, she asked for Amy's physical description or any unique characteristic. And what Paul said was truly shocking. He confirmed that Amy had a scar on her abdomen, a detail that only Susan knew and something that was not public information. This stunned Susan, and she eventually believed Paul's claims. Not long after, Paul contacted Susan again with highly encouraging news. He said that Amy was in a bar in Tulsa, a very dangerous bar that bikers frequented. But Susan was ready to risk everything if it meant that she would have her daughter safe with her. Susan met up with Paul at the bar, but as soon as Paul left to talk to someone, a huge brawl broke out. Susan was utterly terrified, and before she could even comprehend what was happening, she was escorted back by another biker member to a taxi, apparently waiting to take her back to her hotel, leading to another dead end. Paul, though, contacted Susan's attorney not long after, and again, he said that Amy was now in Seattle, and even though Susan had recently suffered from a heart attack, she packed up and went to Seattle. But it was unfruitful, and even though people did remember seeing a submissive, mute girl, there was no sign of Amy. Now, we don't know whether all of this was done to mess with Susan, or if Amy really was kidnapped by a biker gang, and Paul was trying his best to reunite a mother with his daughter with the information he had. But in late 1992, Susan was contacted by a local private investigator, Virginia Schneider, who was working with another private investigator in England on an unrelated case. Turns out the PI was approached in a post office in Falmouth, England, by a man who looked like a biker with all the tattoos and rugged appearance and asked the PI if he wanted a girl. When asked about what kind of girl the biker was talking about, he said that it was a mute American girl from Oyster Bay. Now, if you remember, Amy was originally born in Oyster Bay, and strangely, everyone who seemed to have seen Amy or a girl resembling her defined her in the exact same way. A year later after this incident, though, this lead almost hit a brick wall because the PI in England passed away. And after this, there was no more information on Amy or her whereabouts. But some incriminating things did surface in the years that followed. Fast forward to 1997. Paul's widow came to detectives with some very disturbing details about Amy. It was a confession from Paul before he passed away. He said that the biker gang was responsible for Amy's disappearance but added that they'd now also taken her life. Paul went on to confess that Amy was taken to a party of the pagans in the Everglades, where she was taken advantage of by a large group of bikers, with this being spurred because Amy allegedly insulted them. The intent wasn't to end Amy's life, rather it was supposedly to teach her a lesson. But when Amy fought back, the bikers drugged her into submission and accidentally overdosed her. The members of the gang then proceeded to dispose of Amy's body in a nearby swamp which was believed to have been infested with alligators, which is why she was never found. Now, this could have been a hoax, and maybe Paul's widow was saying all of this for media attention. But we can only imagine what went through Susan's mind when she heard about all this. She was trying so hard to not let go of the hope that Amy was alive, but it was getting harder and harder. It's just so heartbreaking to see Susan go through these bouts of hope and then despair, and to see her grieving while never losing hope that Amy was still out there and alive, it's, it's truly unbelievable. But there was one more distressing thing that had happened behind the scenes, and it turned this rather confusing case right on its head. So a few months after Amy's disappearance, Susan, who was busy trying to find her daughter somewhere in the dark hole that was this biker gang, started receiving very bizarre phone calls from someone who was later found to be a man. Sometimes no one spoke on the other end of the line, and other times there would just be heavy breathing. Unfortunately, the police could never trace the calls, as most of them were made from a local payphone. Since there was no security cameras either, it was really hard to determine who this mysterious caller was. Even after narrowing the payphone location down, the police held stakeouts in hopes to catch the treacherous caller, but still it seemed as though this caller had found out information about this because he never showed up to the same payphone again and resumed calling Susan from another payphone. The caller contacted and tormented Susan for almost 21 years with a varying pattern. Sometimes Susan received seven to eight calls a day from the caller, 
whereas other times there would be lapses of months in between calls. Regardless, it was terrifying and emotionally draining to Susan to no end. Almost five months into the call stalking, the caller said the following words, I have her, this is Johnson. Before Susan could ask Johnson anything though, he would abruptly hang up. On calls, Johnson even agreed to meet Susan twice, but you guessed it, he never showed up. Johnson, if that even was the caller's real name, called and drove Susan insane with very chilling details about Amy, saying things like, hurry up, you have little time. Amy has two weeks to live, and wow, Amy looks magnificent right now. Now, some people thought that this was just a very sick prank, but Johnson knew a lot about the Billick family. For instance, he knew that Susan's husband, Ned, had passed away in 1992, and Johnson called Susan shortly after saying, quote, you're all alone now, aren't you? You better watch out. I wish I could tell you that this was a scene from a terrifying movie, but unfortunately, it wasn't. Susan was living in a perpetual nightmare. Enduring this two decade long terror while trying to find her daughter was absolutely draining for Susan. And you can only imagine her mental and emotional state during this time. She was going in circles with no results, which was understandably frustrating. But in 1993, everything changed. And finally, Susan got to hear some good news for the first time in a while. See, in 1993, Johnson started to use a cell phone to contact Susan, which finally led to the call getting traced by the FBI. On November 17, 1995, a 48-year-old man named Henry Johnson Blair was arrested. He was the man who'd haunted Susan with his cryptic phone calls for 21 years. Henry Johnson Blair was born in 1947 and was a married father of two daughters who suffered from OCD and alcohol abuse. He worked for the United States Customs Service for 24 years. So was Amy with Henry? Did Susan finally get her daughter back after 21 long years? Well, unfortunately, the answer to both of these questions was no. Henry claimed that he didn't even know who Amy was and said that he got sexual pleasure from making hoax calls and that he was only messing with Susan. He also claimed to call and torment other families whose loved ones had gone missing. He essentially blamed everything on his OCD and alcohol abuse. Now, all of this seemed highly convincing. First of all, suffering from OCD and alcohol abuse is bad enough, but that's no excuse to torment a helpless woman, especially with disgusting remarks about her missing daughter. And that too for 21 years. Even a sick prank should never go that far. So something definitely seemed fishy about Henry's statement. And to everyone's surprise, soon more things surfaced. Remember Amy's diary entry? Well, it turns out that Henry's nickname was coincidentally Hank. To add to the pile of eerie coincidences, Henry, AKA Hank, was relocated to none other than South America for his job. And it was strangely right around the time when Amy wrote about going there in her diary. Now, I don't know about you, but it couldn't be a coincidence that Amy had plans to go to South America with a man named Hank out of all the places in the world. And if that wasn't weird enough, the white pickup truck from the developed photos in Amy's camera looked like the same vehicle and model that Henry drove at that time. All of those revelations pin Henry as the main suspect. So was it possible that Amy actually did know Henry? Did Amy unknowingly leave a clue behind that could possibly lead to answers about what might have happened to her? Well, to everyone's surprise, Henry was never linked to Amy's disappearance, even though there was so much evidence to claim otherwise. In the end, Henry was charged with two counts of aggravated stalking and was given just two years in prison. Susan even filed a lawsuit against Henry for harassing her for so many years, and it was eventually settled for $5 million. Even though we don't know the possible motive Henry might have had, it's still strange to see so many eerie details coincide. Even though nothing officially pinned Henry as the person behind Amy's disappearance, it's safe to say that Henry was definitely more involved in Amy's life than he was letting on. The photos of the white van, Henry's nickname, and him relocating to South America around the same time Amy had plans to go there with so-called Hank can't be mere coincidences. It could be possible that they'd met before and sparked a friendship of sorts. Maybe that friendship morphed into obsession, especially on Henry's part. This could explain why he terrorized Susan for so many years after Amy's disappearance. While the biker gang theory was based on hearsay with no solid leads, Amy's diary entry and the revelations involving Henry that came to light 
were anything but ordinary. But Henry never did come forward with any explanation for the photos of the white truck or van, or Amy's diary entry. And eventually he passed away in 2006 at the age of 59 in Florida. Susan never received any calls from Amy, and there was only inconclusive leads. So is Amy really out there, still in the clutches of a biker gang? Did Amy meet her tragic end in the Everglades? Or did Henry, aka Hank, get away with what's essentially a slap on the wrist for Amy's disappearance and apparent demise and take his secrets to the grave with him? There are just too many questions, and unfortunately not a single answer. But my money is strongly on Henry. That diary entry, it just, it can't be overlooked. And this just seems too obvious to me, even though the case is technically unsolved. Susan, for more than three decades, tried to finally find any clue that could lead her to Amy. And she always tried her hardest to push the investigation forward. A Facebook page called Find Amy Billig was made too. It was the only way for Susan to keep hoping that Amy would someday return to her home. But very sadly, Susan wouldn't get to experience this because on June 7th, 2005, Susan Billig passed away from a heart attack at the age of 80. Susan was a pivotal character in Amy's search. She was a mother who would look straight into the eyes of danger if it meant that she could get her daughter back. And unfortunately, she never found peace or closure until her very last breath. As for Amy's brother, Josh, who's a stonemason, he still spreads the word about Amy on the dedicated Facebook page in hopes that he can get closure about his sister and finally learn whether she's still out there or not, because that's what Amy's parents, especially Susan, wanted the most, to never give up searching for Amy. The Billig family was always so close to finding clues about Amy, but they would get thrown back to square one over and over. This case is particularly devastating because no one to this day knows what happened to Amy. We can only pray that Amy, wherever she is, is in peace. And in the end, all we can do is hope. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to help support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.